Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Norris from Frostburg State University. And in this video, I'm going to talk to you about a synthetic sequence leading to dialkylation of enones. Uh, and the overall transformation is shown here at the top of the screen, um, where we have an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. I'm going to use uh, cyclohexan 2 e one one uh, we we'll go through a sequence of reactions that leads to putting two alkyl groups, one at the alpha position and one at the beta position. And I've just been generic here. I've numbered them R1 and R2. Uh, I'm going to use more specific uh, alkyl groups and specific reagents in, in my example walking through how this works. And then it turns out that, all right, that we actually do R2 first. So perhaps I could have chosen to number them better, but we actually do R2 first. R2 is at the beta position, and we know that these enones are reactive as electrophiles at the beta position if we have a suitable Michael donor. And we know what that is. So in my videos on the Michael reaction, I have described an organometallic reagent it is a nucleophilic alkylating agent that reacts at the beta position. I'm going to use a specific version for this reaction, but generally you can use, um, you know, the identity of R2 can be almost anything as long as you can make one of these cuprate reagents out of it. So, uh, I'm going to use the ethyl one because I want to. Copper. Yep. So as a reminder, these kind of reagents are anions on copper and uh, have a lithium counter ion. And because copper is not as electronegative as some other uh, organometallic or other metals, the, the carbon copper bond isn't as polarized as um, some of the other organometallic compounds. And this leads to, a, a, even though the negative charge is on copper, it's more distributed throughout the, the molecule. And these kinds of things are better nucleophiles at the beta position of alpha-beta unsaturated compounds. And I'm using uh, a cyclic alpha-beta unsaturated ketone on purpose. Uh, but this kind of reaction can happen on, on acyclic systems, and that can actually happen with other types of Michael acceptors as well, so don't, not just ketones. But our first step is the Michael addition. And I'm going to have an ethyl group here. And we have our enolate anion product. And in a typical Michael addition, then we would add a, an acid to this to work it up and generate the neutral product. We're not going to do that today. We're going to interrupt that process by instead adding an electrophile. Uh, and in this case, we're going to talk about using an alkyl halide for an SN2 type reaction. But the reality is, is you can actually use a lot of electrophiles here um, to make all kinds of different things. So you can use, um, you can actually use acid chlorides and make uh, dienes, and you can do all kinds of things. But we're just we're going to talk about the um, alkyl halide version. Now, let's see. I want to use uh, let's be a chlorine, and we'll make it. Uh, butyl group here. And then, uh, as I've discussed in another video, enolate anions can be alkylated by treating them with alkyl halides, and this is indeed what happens. And you know, this sequence of reactions is actually quite powerful because as long as the two reactions work, R1 and R2 can be have a wide structural diversity. And in fact, on the, the cuprate version, uh, R2 can even be aromatic rings uh, and not just uh, aliphatic groups. And as long as the SN2 reaction works, the second alkylation can have a lot of structural diversity as well. 
Right. So this is in general how it works in the mechanism, but I have something else that I want to share with you before the video ends and, and to talk to you about the stereochemistry of this reaction because um, I've kind of not talked about stereochemistry. And this is a reaction that produces two new chirality centers in the structure of the product, at least in this example. I'm going to use uh, this particular example because I want to look at this product. So we have one with a condensed lithium diethyl cuprate, okay. and then two. Well, here I'll put in the two. I can at least I can at least draw chlorobutane, one chlorobutane. So. You know, the reaction produces two new chirality centers, which means there are actually four possible stereoisomers, but only two of them actually happen. This reaction is, is or stereo selective for the anti so we get this trans arrangement. Um, and because the molecule is, uh, because the, the, the reactant is achiral, we do get the racemic mixture. So we get both enantiomers of the product. So let's talk about where this stereoselectivity comes from. So I'm going to paste in here now um, an attempt to represent that enolate anion for the SN2 step and a three-dimensional structure. And one of the things that's really important to note is that four carbon atoms in the ring, uh, that enolate ring, let's just bring it down here, four carbon atoms in this enolate ring have to be in the same plane because of because of the resonance that creates sp2 hybridized carbons here, so we typically draw that double bond. I'm going to put bold bonds across where these things are, but these four carbon atoms have to be in the same plane. And so I've kind of represented that here. I haven't shown all the carbon atoms, but here they are. This one, this one, this one. I'm not showing the carbon labels because it gets a little mess messy, but there they are. And then the rest of the ring is kind of kinked in this this um, strange, it's almost like a, a half chair or twist boat kind of shape uh, to accommodate that planar structure uh, with one carbon atom pointing up and one carbon atom pointing down. And then, and then here's where our, our ethyl group is relative to this. Now this is one enantiomer of this transition state, or of this intermediate, the other enantiomer, of course, the mirror image of this thing. Okay. Move this out over here. And in this structure, I'm going to add, I'm going to actually, I'm going to add the hydrogen atom on this position because it's still there. And um, you know, the hydrogen atom, this is, this is kind of messy, right? But in this structure with the way that it's all set up, there is a space, a pocket, if you will, for which the SN2 reaction more easily happens. Ooh, I left off my chlorine atom. Hold on a moment. Let's get my arrows. Right. And so the SN2 reaction more easily happens from the bottom face of this three-dimensional structure than it does from the top. And so that leads to this specific case. We've got the ethyl group up. The butyl group is going to be down. Okay. So that leads to this enantiomer of the product. If we have the enantiomer of that intermediate, so the, the mirror image, we would get the mirror image of the product. Let me try something. Eh. Uh, one of the arrows didn't, some of the arrows didn't behave. Oops. I can fix those though. 
So here is that mirror image. Oh, you can't see it. Hold on a moment. Let me, um, let me get rid of some things so I can drag all this up. You can see all of it together. There we go. Here is that mirror image. Okay. In this mirror image, the ethyl group is down, and the accessible face for the SN2 reaction is on the top, and the butyl group ends up facing upwards. So... In an undergraduate course, sometimes drawing these kinds of complex three-dimensional intermediates is, is a little bit beyond the, the scope of the course, but it's within your power uh, to do these things to understand the, uh, the three-dimensional stereoselective and stereospecific outcomes of reactions. Thank you for watching.